Hold that thought. We sure. want to get it. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. We're good to go. Thanks. Yeah. So this is this is um, um from a from something that I um presented, but that also will um be in the book. Um, and I'm going to present it under the title that I um, gave it as a lecture, um, actually in Germany. Um, it's called The End of Ethics. Um, and it plays off of um, and engages Bonhoeffer's ethics. And here you, you'll see, as I said last week, um, how uh, Bonhoeffer is in any ways. Um, I'm getting an echo. Um, I don't know if I'm hearing it now. Are you all hearing me OK? Hello? Yes, we're hearing you. OK. Okay, fantastic. I just wanted to make sure the echo stopped, so I think I'm good now. Um, it it, it um, uh, picks up on things we were talking about last week and my claim that um, um, my endeavor, let's say, to read Bonhoeffer in relationship to questions of whiteness. So let me jump right in, and I'm going to give you a quote from um, Ethics as Formation, which is um, a chapter, the second chapter in Bonhoeffer's book called Ethics. I'll say some more about the importance of that document. But the chapter that I'm going to be keying off of is the one called Ethics is Formation. I'm going to give you a quote from that. And then I'm going to give you another quote um, from um, the uh, African American writer um, and um, literary historian, um, Saidia Hartman. Um, Ethics is Formation, the Bonhoeffer quote is this, it remains true that no other form can appear alongside the form of Jesus Christ for only he is the one who overcomes and reconciles the world. Only this form can help. Okay, only this form can help. So hold that on one side of your brain. Now here's the other, hold this on the other side of the brain. I think this is Saidiya Hartman. Um, and this is from a piece um, um, called The Position of the Unthought. What goes unthought? She says this. I think she's in an interview and she's responding to the interview. I think that gets at one of the fundamental ethical questions, problems, crises for the West, namely the status of difference and the status of the other. It is as though in order to come to any recognition of common humanity, the other must be assimilated, meaning in this case, utterly displaced and effaced. Okay, that's the end of the quote. So those two, only this form can save us, Jesus Christ and then the question of, of the ethical as the question of difference. That's Saidiya Hartman. Okay, so we're gonna be moving between those two. <laughs> okay, let me just kind of start to read what I have here. Dr. Um, Carter, I, is this the uh, the text you're drawing from? Actually, um, that's Saidiya Hartman's first book, but the yeah. um, the the uh, text is an interview that she gave. Actually, oh, she was inter she was um, being interviewed by um, uh, uh, Frank Wilderson, actually. And she, she rolled out that statement. Um, and the, the title of the interview is called The Position of the Unthought. And um, I can find the reference and send it to you and you can get it to people. Perfect, thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, so this is what I wrote here. <clears throat> For the time allotted me, I would like to engage the theme. Um, this was given at a conference, so I'm just gonna read what I have here. The theme of, of the conference was called Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Public Ethics. I'm gonna engage the theme of the conference by grappling with the long-standing theological and ethical forces animating the present. I put it this way because as I see it, it's impossible to engage either Dietrich Bonhoeffer or the question of public ethics without having um, some cognizance that such an engagement takes place within a framework in which fascisms, as I talked about last week, are sweeping Western democracies, including that of the United States in the age of Donald Trump. For this reason, in the following meditation on the prospect, uh, um, following meditation on the prospect um, and possibilities or not of what something called ethics might mean in the present, I can't help but keep my eye trained on the problem of fascisms as expressing an intense and aggressive whiteness. Indeed, my concerns with the current forces of an aggressive whiteness as part and parcel of the global idea of race um, has to do with how a certain theological consciousness, <coughs> excuse me, or more precisely, a certain political theological um, consciousness whose underbelly is a monomythical consciousness. I can talk about that a little bit. Caught within the historical and philosophical eddies 
of what one scholar has called the perils of the one. This animates and drives an aggressive whiteness. To speak of the perils of the one and to speak of monomythic thinking in politics is to speak to how, is to call attention to how life comes to be structured around or ordered through the singular rather than an understanding of our entangled multiplicities as such. The one, parentheses and only, the one and only, the one imposed on top of, in settler colonial fashion, of course, the entangled animacies and multiplicities of the earth, of our life together. Monopolitics, monotheology, monomyth, in refusal of the poly, the many, the polyglot, the polymythic, the polypolitical, the multi-social, the socialism of the ensemble. You get my point. Let's just call it dark church. What if whiteness, and by this I don't just mean white people, even if white people or the peculiar institution of the white race is in it um, is peculiarly instituted through whiteness. What, I, what if whiteness is a monotheism? What if it is a monopolitical myth? What if what's needed, therefore, is an alternative mythography of the many? Myth otherwise. While my own work as an attempted <laughs> creative writer um, and someone who works to do intellectually subversive things wants to think through that alternative. My specific concern here is with the problem of whiteness so described as fascism and as a violent political theology of the one. And therefore with the, um, and with the imagination of the human that's internal to this. Given this, I ask, what if whiteness as the imaginary inside of white supremacy is in fact an ethical program that must come to an end? And what if the, as a theological ethical program of sovereignty as racial governance or ethnological governance on ordering sovereignty as racial capitalism, what if whiteness is also and as such a theological program that has devastated the earth? in the name of something we call world, the world of man. What if old Jimmy, and I mean all three of them here, James Baldwin, Jimmy Cone, and James Brown, <laughs> but especially James Brown. What if old Jimmy was right when he said, it's a man's world? And what if rewriting the terms, the grammars of the ethical, the grammars of the political, uh, the grammars of political ethics at the limits of justice, the violent theological grammar book of man, capital M, and thus um, of the world requires in fact the end of ethics along with the end of the world as we know it. The claim that I'm presenting to us this morning is precisely this, it does need to end. But in making my case, I aim to do what other accounts of fascisms of the present, at least to my knowledge, more or less have yet to do. There are two points to this. First, I want to clarify how the fascism sweeping Western democracies um, are in fact expressions of whiteness, where whiteness must be understood, again, not first devolving towards phenotype, but must be understood as an ethical political regime and agenda. Denise Ferreira da de Silva, black feminist um, philosopher, um, um, ethical theorist. Denise Ferreira da de Silva gives us a formulation through which to understand this ethical program and this program that bears the name ethics. She calls it, and I'm following her lead, a global idea of race at the center of which is the very figure of what we call the human, humanity writ large. The idea of race for um, Ferreira da Silva helps us understand is at once a project for politically organizing the planet. Let me say that again. The idea of race, and when we say white supremacy, 
what we are saying, I'm following De Silva's lead, is at once a project for politically organizing the planet. We might even say economically as well, organizing the planet, which, including, which includes controlling planetary population flows, the flows of money, et cetera, and precisely in politically organizing the planet, um, subjecting the earth to conversion, to convert the earth to materials for the extraction of value. This is the would-be conversion of the earth into property. <laughs> that is into a commodity, something to be owned, and thus into what one scholar has called an extractive zone. You can extract things from it. All of this is the ethics of the human as the deep logic of fascism, as the driver of the global idea of race, as the ethics of the human, in short, as the project of man, capital M. Few accounts of fascism in the present, few accounts of fascism in the age of Trump make this vital connection. Namely, and here I state it again, that current fascisms are an aggressive expression of the ethics of the human or the project of man as the global idea of race and that present fascism, fascisms are an aggressive ethics that propels Western modernity as such. And thus, what must be clarified is how whiteness, capital W, how whiteness then, whether in its aggressive fascist mode or in its quote unquote benevolent fascist mode, is the animating logic or grammar of world consciousness and that as such, it is a program of ethics. Again, parenthetically, my project is to say we need to end ethics as we know it. The ethical as we know it is unethical. <laughs> to continue what I've written here. But following this, the second matter that requires clarifying is how the planetary logic of the human that I, je that I just noted as the grammar of whiteness that animates the very nature of Western politicalness and global order is bound up with theological practice. One of my comrades in Black Studies, his name is Calvin Warren, has made the powerful case that the figure of the human as a figure of whiteness is a figure, as he puts it, of ontological terror. This scholar has argued, um, has argued that to be, to exist, the to be of the human form of being, the to be of human being, only comes online, as it were, by producing its racialized others as figures of improper being, figures for whom their existence is wrong. They live out of or are expressions in their very existence of what might be called the wrongness of being, the wrongness of their existence. This is a play also on the scholar Sylvia Winter. Thus, to invoke Shakespeare, if I might, thus to be or not to be is indeed precisely the question where the whiteness as the righteousness, shall we say, the righteousness of being over against the non-whiteness and especially the blackness and brownness and the wrongness of being displays itself through a vision of the publicness and the politicalness of the publicness and the political that is intent on structurally um, managing their existence because it's supposedly wrong. When Calvin Warren bring, what Calvin Warren brings rigorously into view is how the question of human being as the question of life and death in the modern world is nothing less than the question of the racialized, the racialization of existence the racialization of life and death, and how that racialization of life and death, how the racialization of existence is itself a practice of anti-Black terror. Terror here is ethics. <laughs> Let me make sure I say that again. Terror here is ethics. Within the world of man, to impose terror is not seen as unethical. <laughs> that, that's what's so frightening here. Terror is ethics. 
in and as the form of the human. But terror is also the political. And by that, I don't just mean electoral politics. It is the political in as much as it is the problem of political anthropology as racialized terror, a mode of organizing things. And yet, with this said, and I'm with Calvin on this, <laughs> think of us as a duet. <laughs> and yet, with this said, what must also be contended with is how the terror of the human as a kind of white terror is not just ontological terror, but it is theological terror. Let us call this ontotheological terror. The tools of theology were also mobilized to support the terror against black, brown, non-white forms of being as wrong. I'm interested in the theological underbelly of our present fascism, of the aggressive US whiteness, which is also a planetary whiteness we are living through. And what is needed is to bring the problem of man, capital M, <coughs> excuse me, or dare I say it, the fascisms of the very notion of the human into view as the problem of political theology. That is to say, my project here aims to expose political theology as white supremacy and to do so by attending to how the category of the human functions like a God term that gives whiteness or white supremacy its mythic and in this way, its political force. Now, take a breath. <sighs> if this is my general itinerary, then I want to offer a bit of specificity in elaborating on how white supremacy as the program of the human and thus as a project of ethics is a theological ethical endeavor, how it is political theology, and then what it might mean to release the Christian imagination, indeed release religion and the sacred from white supremacy's theopolitical grip. More specifically, I would like to gain some traction in clarifying how whiteness and thus how white supremacy is a theological ethical endeavor by way of Dietrich Bonhoeff, he who convenes us this morning on Zoom. <laughs> I'm interested in the theological roadmap Bonhoeffer set out in his book, Ethics, for the kind of world he hoped would emerge after World War II. That's my claim about what ethics is, is trying to do. It's political material force. Worked on clandestinely by night candlelight. While, while during the day he held down a job in the upper ranks of the German government. While working, while feeding information to the allied forces to bring down the, the German government in World War II. Bonhoeffer's posthumously published book, Ethics. It was published by his friend, Eberhard Becker, after he died at the end of the war, after he was, um, he was, he was hung. Bonhoeffer's posthumously published book, Ethics, not only tried to dream a world beyond what we might call narrow nationalisms, such as he was living through in his homeland of Germany, but even more, he tried to articulate a new theological, a new ethical vision with attendant protocols for such a world to emerge once the haze of war cleared. It was a roadmap for a world that would be internationalist, as he wanted, post-fascist, that's what he wanted, post-Aryan, he wanted that too, or in this sense, I put it in air quotes, post-racial. Crucially, for Bonhoeffer, such a world will only be possible were it grounded in a reimagined vision of the human. Pause. I'm arguing here to give it to you, you know, repeatedly, that at stake in the ethics, and especially those opening chapters around Christology, is he's trying to work out a new vision of the human, to uncouple our vision of the human from the narrow nationalisms and the Arianism that was he saw as propelling the war itself, what, what led up to war. That is to say, a post-fascist world is only possible were the world grounded in a Christ-centeredness, a Christ-centered, non-supersessionist, and Jewish-embracing humanism. That's sort of what he wants. He sees that as what was the problem or what was lacking in leading to the war. Now, whether or not that's sufficient, 
I'm going to call it the question. I'm just trying to kind of lay out what I think he's doing. My claim before you this morning is simple. Bonhoeffer's Christologically robust vision for a post-fascist, post-World War II war so that we would never go that way again, the world would never go that way again, or what he sees as a concrete ethics of the West does not work. Indeed, the rise of right-wing populism, both in the U.S. and around the world, in fact, can work with the kind of world that Bonhoeffer envisioned of a more embracing and ethical humanism. We're living in a fascist situation right now, and he proposed something that will hopefully get us out of it by grounding it in, in a more robust Christological vision. And therefore, it seems to me, what he put on the table and what we're living through somehow are compatible. It didn't stop it. I contend that this is because, why was this, why, how is this possible? It's because Bonhoeffer's vision, notwithstanding that it's efforts to be non-supersessionist, notwithstanding it's efforts to not be anti-Semitic, et cetera, et cetera. Bonhoeffer's vision still reproduces at an even deeper level, the fundamental whiteness understood as both a political economy of power and a structure of desire and belief to which he'd been apprenticed. That whiteness is more than a personal failing. I'm not trying to just sort of say he's a per, I'm not trying to put the, um, the onus here on personal failing. It structures rather, this is where I am going, not personal failing, it structures what I call the imaginary, the imagination, and it shows up in his work, in his vision, even when that vision aimed consciously, Christianly, to address fascism directly. Neither Bonhoeffer's defense of the Jewish people, nor his early sojourn through Harlem at Union Theological Seminary, no less, his sojourn into black church life at, at um, Abyssinian, nor finally his reviving of a classical creedal Christology were sufficient vaccines against the virus of whiteness, against whiteness's capacities to adapt to and within his thinking. Rather, whiteness worked with and through his efforts to release theology from fascism. My concern, I have a nice little sentence here, but here's the force of my concern. How did that work? <laughs> It's like, what is going on? My concern is with how this worked in Bonhoeffer's case, given that his case and his effort to release Christianity and thus ethics from right wing populism remains so close to us. Now, let me be clear as, I, uh, as clear as I can about this argument, what it is and what it isn't. More than simply a critique or a supposed takedown some might say a shakedown <laughs> of Bonhoeffer, I'm most interested here in what haunts Bonhoeffer himself and thus what's bigger than Bonhoeffer, but that with, with a careful look at Bonhoeffer, we might get some sense of what's going on. To um, be a bit more direct, I'm interested in Bonhoeffer as symptomatic in the domain of theology and of ethics of what black feminist theorists, again, Denise Ferreira de Silva has called the global idea of race. Again, to try to be a little bit more direct off the page here, I'm interested in how Bonhoeffer remains caught in the global idea of race, even as he's struggling to bring that problem into view. <laughs> this talk explains this theologically inflected racial colonial dynamic of white subjectivity in which Bonhoeffer specifically um, and that the intellectual practice called theology and ethics more broadly, and that the West at the most general level are all still caught, even as I want to gesture, hopefully by the end of this talk, to what I simply will call the alternative. That is to say, and I'm going to frame that into alternative in terms of blackness. But here, I don't mean blackness as caught within the frameworks of the racial categories I'm talking about. I'm talking about blackness in its relationship to racialization, but in its excess beyond it too. One might think of this as a kind of 
black mysticism, a kind of effort to think blackness as ecstasy, as dark as a dark radiance um, exceeding that which we now know. And finally, as a critical practice of contemplation, or shall we say what we're doing right now, study. All right. Now I'm gonna run through my basic argument. <laughs> and I'm a, um, you got some of it last week. So if I skip around and I leave something out and somebody has a question, just raise your hand. But um, I wanna try and get through this um, little quick run through ethics in no more than 10 to 15 minutes so I can leave time for us to talk. Okay, here we go. I would like to turn to Bonhoeffer's important work, important work ethics. Seen through to publication by Bonhoeffer's longtime friend, Eberhard Becker. Ethics is the book Bonhoeffer worked on while working in the German government, but covertly as part of a resistance movement at the same time, intent on the resistance movement, taking, bringing Hitler down in the, in the government of German National Socialism. In effect, Bonhoeffer was working quietly in the interest of a coup against his own government. But what captivates me about ethics as a text, as if that were not enough, <laughs> indeed as a kind of case study of Christian theological thinking, is that what motivates Bonhoeffer to write ethics in snatches of time at train station platforms in the, and in late night writing sessions is the future itself. Ethics emanates from and pines for the future. Earlier I said, that it provides a roadmap for a future in the aftermath of World War II. But the stakes are way deeper than providing simply a roadmap if by that is meant any kind of ethical theory or program, and that's a quote from him, that can guarantee or secure the future against tyranny. In this sense, ethics is not trying to provide a plan. And nor for that matter is Bonhoeffer's insistence that ethical theories or programs can't save us due to any ethical indifference in our times. To the contrary, Bonhoeffer tells us that coming up with some new magic bullet ethical theory that will resolve all of our problems, um, and, um, all of our problems, or to come up with a program that can bring down tyranny and ensure that tyranny will never come back is because the tyranny that he and his contemporaries were up against, he tells us, pose the kind of specific and concrete problems that, and this is a quote, that we, um, and we gotta interrogate that we, that we have never had before in the history of the West, quote unquote. Addressing the tyranny confronting the West requires a more radical diagnosis, shall we say. I don't mean radical in the sense of a particular political stance. That's not what Bonhoeffer is after. Um, because in that sense, I don't take Bonhoeffer to actually be radical, but that's another story. Bonhoeffer's radicalism is meant to be diagnostic. He wants to get to the root, radical as root, the root of the crisis. Why at root are we in this is his question. Now, Bonhoeffer's diagnosis, his answer to that is simple. This comes out in the opening pages of Ethics as Formation. He argues he sees the West as having veered off or fallen away from, that's a quote, the German word is Abbal, um, fallen away from its roots. It's gotten away from its roots, the roots of the West. That's why we're in this situation, he says. Having gone into what he calls the dark night, quote unquote, and into what he also colorfully calls, and this is a quote as well, the demonic abyss. That is, having gone into the void of a possible non-existence due to our falling away from our roots and our mandate as the West, having fallen into a negative or an abysal obgroomed, again, another word for abyss, the fascist tyranny to which the West has succumbed um, has arisen and it is of a theological sort. On Bonhoeffer's reading, fascism is, and I use a theological language, it is a lapsarian condition. It is of the fall, of fall. Um, it is a condition of, to use his language again, Western nihilism. Having lost its theological way, the West, as he sees, he sees it, is it has fallen away and it is in free fall. This is what the war, World War II, signifies as Bonhoeffer sees it. So serious is this falling away that no ethical theory, no ethical program, be it Kantian, 
Hegel, pragmatist, whatever have you, that's the Western philosophical tradition that he was familiar with. None of those um, philosophers and orientations toward the ethical um, can um, parachute the West to safety. Only a restored, as Bonhoeffer sees it, theological vision, one that takes back, takes back, takes the West back to its roots can save us. Again, us, we need to interrogate that, we're coming to. It was the work of thinking through such a theological vision that motivated Bonhoeffer's frenzied writing of material now collected under the name ethics. More still, it was precisely such a theological vision as bound up with the deep roots of the West that motivated his clandestine activities to bring down the Hitler government, the Hitler regime, and the Hitler-led German government. At stake regarding those deep roots was that we've fallen away from was for Bonhoeffer nothing less than a love for humanity writ large. And that was what was under attack in the tyranny of fascism. Thus the task Bonhoeffer undertakes in ethics is to tell the story of these lost roots and in so doing reclaim those roots so as to reestablish a certain stability, a, a kind of coherence and thus save the West by focusing attention back on a theological understanding of the very meaning of the human that is at the ground of the West. That is on a political quay theological understanding of the human as not limited by or confined by national boundaries. It's a critique of nationalism. The articulation and in this way, the reclamation of such a vision as the fundamental expression of ethics offers as Bonhoeffer sees it more than what any narrowly ethical theory or program that assumes those nationalist terms or projects thinks it can guarantee against tyranny, against right wing, and Bonhoeffer would also include what he sees as left wing populisms or simply against fascism. Focusing principally on Ethics' second chapter titled Ethics' Formation, I would like to follow Bonhoeffer's elaboration of a theological vision and ultimately then a theological ethics that he thinks cuts fascisms off at the pass. My intention is not simply to recount what Bonhoeffer says, rather it is to expose how his vision, while well-intended, fails precisely because of how whiteness generally and white supremacy specifically as a global ordering system goes uninterrogated. Now, from the outset, I wanna note a possible objection to this approach to reading Bonhoeffer, that is reading him with whiteness in view and offer a preliminary rebuttal. <laughs> it might be objected coming out of the gate that while the question of race may have been coming into view for Bonhoeffer, the specific whiteness, specific issue of whiteness was not in play for him. Here in a certain sense, I'm talking to certain like Bonhoeffer scholars, and I want to be careful because some of them might be listening, and I don't want to offend them. But nevertheless, I'm I'm coming I'm coming against an argument that I constantly get about this approach. So bear with me. Our um, brother Reggie <laughs> Williams is on the call. Okay, well Reggie's with me, so I got backup. <laughs> good. good. At least I think I got back up. No, I got back up. Reggie Higgins, good people. Uh, it might be objected coming out of the gate that while the question of race may have been coming into view for Bonhoeffer, but the specific issue of whiteness was not in play for him. Nowhere in his writings does he really note, <laughs> nowhere I see you, Reggie, nowhere in his writing, uh, writings does he really note this as an issue. Thus, it is a bit anachronistic, it may be objected to employ this category as an analytic or a frame for analysis. My response is twofold. First, at first, at, um, mo first and most briefly, I do not think that employing categories of analysis from one time frame to illuminate possible, possible issues in another time frame is necessarily problematic. It has to be done with care, but it's not necessarily problematic. For example, lessons learned um, regarding the nature of modern racial slavery can cast light on more ancient forms of slavery and vice versa. Such conceptual commerce is what drives the research behind sociologist Orlando Patterson's massive three volume work on freedom and slavery in the Western world. A similar claim could be made about gender as a modern category. Thus, I would not make an, ab make an abstract, even a metaphysical rule against anachronism as such. Each case must be considered on its its merits, and I hope I make a case that can stand, stand the merits, stand on its merits. But more to the point, 
of Bonhoeffer's ethics, the readings I the reading I propose here of this important text, a text produced in the heat of German fascism during the early 1940s or the years of the Second World War, and with a view to elaborating afresh a theoethical vision that short circuits fascism, cutting it off at the past, so to speak, for future generations after the war, is that ethics is driven by a surrogate category of whiteness, namely the category of the human. Let me say that again. It is driven by a, a surrogate category that stands in for whiteness. Even as Bonhoeffer himself is trying to grapple with that, he can't unpack that problem. There's a link between the general category of the human and whiteness as an ordering, a, a political ordering term. That's my big point. Bonhoeffer's Christologically grounded vision of the human is elaborated in ethics as formation. That is to say, the theological anthropology he articulates is, and here I borrow from Sylvia Winter, that category of the human is overdetermined in Bonhoeffer's thought. The anthropos in theological anthropology, which is to say the anthropos in political anthropology, the anthropos we might even say in the Anthropocene is the figure, or in Bonhoeffer's language, we would say the form, the gestalt, ethics as formation, the form of man, where man here must be understood as Western man, the we, the us, the human, Western man. Even as Bonhoeffer, is, he's, he's got this kind of ambivalent relationship to that term. He wants to hold the Westernness and thus the whiteness of the term, even as he's trying to come after Aryan national practice. But what makes this all the more interesting, if not also somewhat tricky for those reckoning with this term, with this in terms of Christian theology as a discourse is that Bonhoeffer's restoration of an expansive and would be benevolent vision of the human, and indeed his vision of the human as itself a particular kind of we, and thus as a statement of community aims ultimately to express the identity of Jesus Christ. It is an expression of a robust two natures Christology that aims to take seriously the very man, quote unquote, side of the very God, very man, confession or creedal language. Bonhoeffer deems this language important not merely for confession's sake or creedal sake, but because as he sees it internal to the Christian confession around the person and the work of Jesus Christ is an ethics of reconciliation which is to say an ethics not predicated upon division um, or separation as the basis of the world's reality or the basis of what is real. Rather, what is real in the world and uh, what is real about the world is that which is for him one. Where unity or oneness here means overcoming separation on the condition of, or the condition of division. Now, pause. You heard me set up talking about the perils of the one. You already hear me. I'm basically already beginning to say that Bonhoeffer is still caught inside of it. <laughs> Let me continue. The real is given in and as reconciliation, according to Bonhoeffer. Indeed, his claim is that when one looks at Jesus Christ, one is then gazing upon reconciliation made real, made present as real presence in all of its concreteness. I have a quote here, I'm not gonna read the quote and I'm gonna like compress a lot of stuff here because I wanna like jet to the end because I think you get my point. And if I had more time, I could generate the quotes that I have to really show you how this is working. If, if somebody wants to ask and port to some of those, but I'm just gonna compress how this works and then I'm gonna go to the end so that we can have the rest of the time to talk together. Um, what Bonhoeffer do, does in Ethics as Formation is he takes the divine, the very man, very God side, very human, very divine side <clears throat> of the Christological formulation that God is divine and human. He takes, he takes, he does two things with it. He sees between um, the divinity and the humanity coming together an ethics of reconciliation between creator and creation. For him, that's reconciliation. That's the first step. Then he drops inside of the human side of that reconciliation dynamic, creation. And he says that in Christ, and this is just classical, you know, kind of like Chalcedonian Christology. He says, in Christ, all human beings are held together in him. He's the holding together of all human nature. 
and brings it all into reconciliation with God. So inside of the human side of the divinity, humanity of Christ, there's another reconciliation that's happening. And so that's the, that's the next move. So there's reconciliation writ large between creation and, and the creator. Then there's reconciliation inside of creation and human nature specifically that Christ holds together himself in reconciling us to God. That's the second reconciliation. Then he basically says, the human side that holds all human nature together reconciled has a deep kind of grounding in the West. The West has been the carriers of that because it's been in the West that Jesus Christ came. So far, so good. Then he draws out the politics of the, of the, rec of the West being the carrier of Jesus Christ and thus the carrier of reconciliation for the world that Christ brings to God. And the, the politics of that is this, is that the Western nations cannot fundamentally understand their identity in compartmentalized nation states. Because in the West, the peoples of the West are reconciled in Christ who reconciles all of creation, who reconciles all of creation with God. This means that he's after a distinct politics, a narrow nationalist separatist politics in the West is precisely what's been overcome. And this is why he says we can't think in the West from nationalism. We have to think from the unity of the West because the unity of the West is an internationalism. The unity of the West is where the Western peoples have been reconciled in Christ and they become the vehicles for the reconciliation of all of the peoples of the world in Christ who are then reconciled to God. Now, so I hope that I marched us through those steps of reconciliation. It's a multi-layered step of reconciliation, all held together in Christ. But the key thing here again is that the oneness that is held together in Christ is born by the West. The West becomes a unique carrier of Anthropos of the human, of man, capital M, in Christ. And this is what I call a benevolent reconciliation practice. Now, take a breath. This is the last move I'm gonna make, then I'm gonna stop. I'm, I'm summarizing what I've written here. The last move is this, and it's crucial. By the time we get to the end of ethics as formation, Bonhoeffer no longer hides the upshot of what he's saying upshot of what he's saying on the ground. And the, the reason why he, he, he resists Hitler is because of what I just said. Hitler has defied the ethical, theological norm that drives the West. The West is a consortium, an international unity of peoples, the Western peoples. <laughs> he names countries, the UK, France, it's the European countries, and then he goes across the Atlantic. And of course, he only mentions the North Atlantic, the US <laughs> and Canada, not Mexico, not the Caribbean, not all that other stuff. The unity of the Western peoples is an international fraternity. And I use that word intentionally, even if it's problematic the way I'm, I'm saying it, but I mean it, it's a fraternity of men, of, 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 of the fraternity of man, capital M. Whose, whose politics is internationalist. The problem with Hitler is that Hitler continued to insist on a politics of nationalism rather than a politics of the international. So it's a critique of nationalism, national fascism. Here's the problem though, after Bonhoeffer says all that, the final, I think it's two to three paragraphs of the chapter, Bonhoeffer says this, and if I can have time, I will give you the whole quote because it's, it's mind blowing. I, it, this is not me overlaying on Bonhoeffer. He says it himself. Bonhoeffer says that the unity of the Western peoples is for the sake of bringing the rest of the world, the rest of the world into Christ. And he's explicit that this is a colonialism. That the, the, the blessings, air quote, of colonialism is that the West, through its unity, brings in the rest of the world. So what do we have here? By the time we get to the end of it, Bonhoeffer has moved the white, whiteness of a narrow Aryan nationalism to the whiteness of a Western internationalism in the name of a kind of missionary colonial benevolence 
for the non-white world to bring all peoples to Christ. This is why at root I'm saying his program doesn't work. The ethical as he's imagining it is still inside of the architecture of the human and it is still a function of theological, ontotheological terror. And if that's the ethical, we must end the ethics of the human as we know it. We must end the ethics of creation as we know it. We must end the ethics of the world as we know it. Now, this is where my own kind of project starts to lift off. Why I do black studies, why I do black critical theory, and why I kind of poeticize in relationship to theology to kind of move it to a black into position and kind of like a, a, a kind of reorientation towards the earth that is opened up vis-a-vis -vis what I mean by blackness. And, and you can also see why when I talk about blackness, I can't be finally talking in the terms of the very racial dynamics I've been talking about. I'm talking about a blackness that is at the end of the day, ecumenical. It is for everybody. It is, it is the ensemble, what I call the ensemble, right? Or what I call the kind of dark church. And I could talk about more about what I mean by that, but let me stop there. And hopefully what I'm getting at is clear enough because I went over about five minutes more than what I, what I was trying to do when I stopped. So let me take a breath and stop there and, 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 and turn it back over to the host and have a, a Q and A time. Well, your timing is uh, divinely ordained because the bells just started. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear them. It was perfect timing. Um, Dr. Carter, thank you. This was amazing. I, we have a couple questions and I'm going to call on folks. Uh, we actually have a question that has uh, lingered from last week, but I'm actually going to uh, put uh, Reggie, Dr. Williams, on the spot here and ask him to uh, open up the Q&A uh, with, uh, with his question and maybe just have the benefit of his presence with us to have you two speak to each other. Dr. Williams, for those of you who may not know, uh, opened us. He was our inaugural, inaugural lecturer for the series uh, and inspired the series. So we have him to thank for, uh, for all of us being here. Okay, Dr. Williams, I'm gonna let you I'm going to let you take it away. I'm, I'm sorry, Andrea, you were, were you going to ask me a question? Was there something specific you wanted to talk about? No, I asked if you wanted to begin with the opening question. Yeah. Do you have any? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK, I, I missed that. I'm sorry. Oh, that's OK. Uh, yeah. No, um, you want a minute well, to think? Let me just say this, though, to begin with. The title, Bonhoeffer Otherwise, is Dr. Carter's. So what, yeah, I should I should I should make sure that everyone knows that that, um, and this is I can begin us with a little story. I spoke about Bonhoeffer this this January, in um, Africa. I had just taught a course to um, McCormick students in West Africa. I went down to South Africa and I was a plenary speaker for the International Dietrich Bonhoeffer Society. This was Bonhoeffer scholars from all over the world. Okay. And that plenary session, I was at a, a South African version of an HBCU. The conference was set at Stellenbosch. I was speaking in a South African version of the HBCU. We all went over there for a day. There were South African black students in the back and they tend to identify with us here in the United States around liberation theology. They love uh, Dr. Cohn, they love Dr. Carter, they love um, his, our buddy, our mutual friend and mentor, Willie Jennings. HBCU means Historically Black College and University. So it was a South African version. It was set up during apartheid for that reason. So I gave my lecture there. In the back, you know, I was, I was talking, I was making a connection between Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, and Nazi Germany and the interaction between Europeans and the um, African continent. Um, that's not a connection that's made typically in Bonhoeffer scholarship. What you just heard from Dr. Carter is not the kind of dialogue that you will hear in Bonhoeffer scholarship. How does Bonhoeffer both suffer from and interact with the Western concept of the human and its national iteration in the concept of the Aryan? How does he deal, how does he deal with this? Um, because it is indeed, that's what killed him. Um, the black, scholar, the black scholars got it, and they got excited in the back of the room. 
Okay. The, my, my colleagues um, who are in Bonhoeffer scholarship really didn't quite, I didn't hear such enthusiasm from them. In fact, I heard some pushback. And I came back, I was, I was so fed up with talking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. This is fact, I was. I was fed up with talking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I got on the, I got on the phone with my dear friend here, and he said, do not stop talking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Do not. Because of this reason, you've got to continue talking about Bonhoeffer. And so what I had done in my, in my project, I need to just tell you the story. Um, and I'm sorry for taking up this, this, this long of time, especially after you just heard such a brilliant um, lecture. But what I did in my project was to show how Dietrich Bonhoeffer con was, was converted, actually. He the, his time in New York was important for him as turning him into a Christian. He created a theological concept. He goes to New York, comes back, and sees now discipleship as imperative. But Jimmy, um, James Baldwin will say this too, as, as, others, as one other scholar that I listened to when I was in Israel said something like this, that the divisions we see in society between, say, the conservative and the, and the, and the progressive, um, they're not just external to us, they're also often mapped on ourselves. That we are oftentimes the self against the self. And that we have to practice self-interrogation as well. What Dr. Carter is saying is that Bonhoeffer needed to practice that self-interrogation. There are things within himself that he did not place under scrutiny, and sp specifically his devotion to the West. Now, if, if he had taken that devotion to the West under scrutiny, what he found in Harlem would have been even more helpful for him. Let me just, let me just, let me just put it, let me just stop with that, because that's really what's more sitting on my heart here, just to make sure that folks know um, what's, what is at stake in this work that Dr. Carter is saying. He became a Christian and he became, uh, at, at least he was, he, he took his faith seriously and what he found when he got back really troubled him as a Christian, but he had some devotion, some, some, um, some loyalties within himself that he also needed to interrogate deeply. For that reason, we can think with him and find him inspirational. But I just wanted to say that on the heels of what Dr. Carter had said. Thanks, uh, Dr. Williams. Thank I appreciate you. that. And um, I'm going to actually, uh, we have about nine minutes. So I'm going to raise the question that's been uh, waiting in the wings for uh, a week since last week. And I'm going to read Debbie's question. Debbie, if you're here, um, feel free to, uh, to add to this. There are actually two questions. Um, so this, Dr. Carter may uh, harken back to some of the things you said last week. Uh, apparently you were talking about mathematics, uh, maybe it was physics, but mathematics, she writes, transubstantiation transforms the bread and the wine into Christ's body and blood. At the level of accidents, the bread and wine remain bread and wine. So this appears to me to be what is the difference between transubstantiation and accidents, how are those related mathematically if I understood the gist of what was being said? And then the second question, I could not write quickly enough to get the entire gist of this. Metaphysically, Europeans became white through the slave trade as the slaves were on the boats. Dr. Carter said the slaves became something while they were on the boats and I didn't catch what that something was and how does this relate to metaphysics, is this some sort of spiritual transformation? Uh, yeah. So, Debbie, if you're here, um, feel free to weigh in and we'll let Dr. Carter answer. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try and be like um, as brief as possible because I wanna see if get as many questions as, as, as possible. What I was trying to get after was to think, to think both the historical event of um, the, uh, of the transatlantic slave slave trade, right? You know, we know that you, we we know the general out contours of that history with all of this. It has so much nuance and complexity to it. But we we know basically about you know the 1492, um, the opening of the Middle Passage or the Atlantic Ocean as a kind of thoroughfare of commerce, um, et cetera, et cetera. We we you know we can talk about all of that. But what I was trying to do was think both the history but also think, you know, what, what changed there? How, how did a certain, to use the language of today, how did a certain imagination of the human, how was it being produced through this history? 
through the social and historical processes of that history. And what I was trying to do is think really between what we might call metaphysics, or I heard one word, spirituality or the spiritual. Let's just talk about the metaphysical. Maybe we can talk about sp spirit world, the immaterial, and the materiality of physics. The immaterial and the material, right? Or the two dimensions of matter, right? Matter in its kind of physicality, matter in its kind of like immateriality, which is not to say it's non-reality, but they're just different dimensions of it. Physically, what happened was this. Various persons from African tribes go into Amina Castle, go into the other various um, um, deport, deportation places. And those deportation places were almost like they, they were the factories, right? Before there was the GM plant, right? You know, steel would go into the GM plant. It gets reworked. And by the time it goes through all these processes, it comes out on the other end of the car. <laughs> so we no longer call the steel steel. We no longer call the rubber rubber. We call it a car, right? The, the, the rubber is, is a tire now. <laughs> Something happened here, right? It's still it's still physical, but our imaginations are fundamentally changed about what we're dealing with, right? And in that transform that transformation also signifies a certain kind of frameworks of value that are now put on it. It's no longer steel that has X Y Z worth, quote unquote, but now it's put together with this rubber that no longer has that worth. That's now a tire and all this other stuff, and now it's got the value that we call a car. <laughs> We've extracted value out of this transformed it reworked it and boom out the other side comes a car and now we're going to pay some pay some money for that that was different from what we would have paid for just the steel by itself that transformation is what i'm trying to think through african peoples tribal peoples go into the castle go on board the slave ship and in that process they come out the other end as the negro and also in that process, the European is coming out the other end in the process as something called white. Okay. Does, does that make sense? So I'm both trying to like give an account of the physics that is going on here and the metaphysics of what's going on here. And then I drew on certain liturgical ritual practices out of the Christian tradition through which we can understand this. I talked about transubstantiation, the Eucharist, the elements of bread and wine through the invocation of the priest minister. This is my body. This is my blood. Except these ritual processes comes out on the other end, the body of Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is my body. That framework that way of thinking about how matter can undergo metamorphosis, metaphysical transformation, when it hits the transatlantic, it's doing new work. Or another way to think about it, many people will talk about, again, the, um, the transatlantic passage, the Atlantic Ocean as a kind of violent baptism. In the hold of these ships, they're being dipped down and then they come up on the other side something new what i'm trying to do again here is get at the cultural symbolics and by cultural symbolics they are no less real because they're cultural symbolics they are real because they shape the imaginary they shape again when i tried to make the distinction between whiteness and white people and argue that whiteness is the imaginary passage through which the white race is born I'm trying to think both the historical social processes of the, of the genesis of something called a white race, we can date it, that's another lecture, but we can date it. And, but the metaphysical transformation that produces the white race, that metaphysics of transformation is around what I call whiteness. When I interrogate whiteness, I'm interrogating the imaginative logics that move through and that animate the kind of material production of the thing we call the white race, and indeed the racial man, man, um, imaginary, the global idea of race, as Denise de Silva will put it. 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Carter. Um, we have a, a, probably two minutes left. I'm going to call oh, on, yeah, I'm going to call on uh, some folks we haven't heard from yet. Um, Dave Miller, I'm going to call on you. You have your hand raised. And I'm also going to ask um, if Carol Nelson, you uh, have a comment. And then uh, maybe we can take two questions at once and then we'll let you close up in, in less than two minutes. So go ahead, Dave, and then Carol. Dr. Carter, uh, I, as I'm trying to, as I listened to you this morning, it feels like to me that there, part of what Bonhoeffer misses is an historical move that takes place far earlier than those that he refers to with the, the shift with Constantine. And is it is there a, a parallel, or when you would speak of blackness or a black church, uh, finding it more analogous to the pre-Constantinian church and the way ethics were done? Mm -hmm. You know, when, when post-Constantinian ethics starts to take on the necessity for the unity of society, uh, and even Augustine will say, you know, he becomes convinced that it's okay to use torture against heretics because it works. Uh, and it, beco it becomes this kind of arguing out of necessity and a kind of pragmatism. And it no longer interrogates the, the, the overarching structure, which the pre-Constantinian church does. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Um, do we want to take another question as yeah. well? Or would you like me to respond um, to this? Let me let me gather because we do need to end okay. in just a moment. Um, okay. Carol, would you like to raise your question? Actually, a comment. Thank you so much. For yeah, a comment. Thanks. Um, as I listened to all this, and I did read one of the books uh, suggested, so I feel as though, though I have a good understanding, good background, good summary of of who Bonhoeffer was all about and what led to his death. Mm -hmm. And listening to all these several weeks, um, the Eureka for me really, it seems, is that most white Christians seem to worship their idealized version of Jesus, which is an Aryan Jesus that permits them lip service to him on Sundays while allowing unchristian thoughts and actions, unlike Christians of color, who it would appear worship the Jewish Jesus. So just my thought. Okay. Um, if, if it's okay, do you want to take one more? Or do you want me to go? No, ahead and that's go with that? good. I think we'll end there. We're actually at time. So 60 seconds, Dr. Carter, on everything. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> on everything. Constantine yeah. to idealize. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, <clears throat> um, following um, um, Dave for a second, I'm going to give a really inadequate because we just don't have enough time um, answer, but I'll do the best I can. Um, I think that what you're hitting upon around Constantine is really, really important. Whether or not um, um, what I mean by blackness is, is some sort of return to a, a pre-Constantinian type of um, um, church practice and church ethical imaginary. Um, I'm open to a conversation on that, though I'm not like sort of intentionally trying to make that move, but I'm open to a conversation around it. But the main thing I want to seize upon from your questioning and the comments um, from your questioning is um, this issue of Constantine. And I would also invoke Chalcedon, the, where the, the doctrines of the two natures of Christ really congeal. Is that, and it, it's simply to say this, is that I think one of the key things we need to think through is the way in which the Constantinian imaginary around how difference, divine nature, human nature in this case, how difference holds together underneath some sort of imagination of the one that imposes a unity on it. In this case, the one Jesus Christ as divine and, as divine and human. The one Jesus Christ in his human nature holding together the, dis, the, the dis, um, desperate dis differences that mark nature as such. That general approach is a politics and it can be charted as well. It is a politics that goes with that. And indeed, it goes next to the way in which arguably a certain kind of general name Constantinian politics works, where the political is a kind of holding together, forcing into a kind of unity the differences under a one. 
It's what I call monopolitics earlier, what I called the monomyth earlier, what I called um, intentionally um, and also pro provocatively the monotheism. These monos, the, the perils of the one is what's at stake here. And whiteness is a, is a modulation in the long history of the political perils of the one, the long history of it. Um, to Carol's point, um, I think that um, what you've summarized is, is fantastic. I think, uh, I think you are, are rightly um, trying, to, trying to understand what's at stake. Once Jesus becomes a figure through who is nothing but me, idealized, but he's basically me, <laughs> he's basically us, you've already got a problem. Um, and one of the things about, you know, um, the uptake of Jesus um, around, around black people and trying to reckon with his, his um, Jewishness, we see it in the work of Cone, many theologians, Dolores Williams, um, at stake and at work is really trying to hold on to Jesus's difference from us in that whatever we might mean by salvation is working through the holding of that difference not the insertion of it into a monomyth, a monopolitics or whatever have you. And I think at root that is right now, we, there are all kinds of nuances and details we could talk about, but at root, your insight is, I think, spot on. It is, it's what I would want us to walk away with. Thank you, that's a great note to end on. Um, I'm really grateful for your two weeks with us. This was just fantastic and a nice, uh, bookend from where we started with Dr. Williams. Charlene, I'm going to let you close us off in prayer. Okay, thank you. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, thank you for the blessing of Dr. Carter, Dr. White, and Dr. Williams. Thank you for their wisdom and their fire that burns within them to engage in this work and their generous courage to bring us further along the way to greater understanding. May the seeds planted today feed off of your holy water and grow into the strongest of mustard trees. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for having me. I'm so honored and grateful to um, have had an opportunity to be with y'all two, two Sundays in a row. It's been just a, just a blessing. So thank you very much. Thank you. What a gift. Really. Thanks. And thanks Alrighty. for being here too. <laughs> Um, see you in service, everyone. Have a blessed Sunday. Look forward to Alrighty. seeing you there. Bye. All righty. Thank you. Is there any way we could just get a digest of what was said? I am thoroughly, thoroughly confused. And I wonder how many people also, I would wait, I would posit that less than 50% understood what the lecturer was saying, but I don't know. Do you have particular questions, um, Merv, that um, you can email? No, no, well, I, I told them to email Bruce. I mean, I just kindly wanted a digest of what uh, Thelonious said. I followed him last week fine. I mean, Dave, did I ask you the question? David is, David is a theologian. A lot of you are theologians. I know a lot about history and church history, but I could not follow what, 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 uh, what, what, what the lecture was saying, unfortunately. I mean, it's, he's very, very intelligent. That's not a question. And I think I'm fairly intelligent, but I could not follow what, like, did, the theologians followed him everything, every, uh, or, or Z Z Zenobia, Did, could you follow that? Okay, great, okay. I'll, I'll ask him if he has some notes he wants to share. I know this is uh, in a forthcoming published volume, so he may be a little hesitant. I see, okay. Yeah. Their uh, pre-published work, but I'll ask him if he has some notes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, basically, when you have a thesis, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta digest at the front. You know, and that adds clarity. It's a, I, I'm not trying to be a jerk about this. I just am look, asking for intellectual understanding. And I'm frustrated when I can't understand something. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mer. Sorry we didn't get to your question. No, no, no. It does, does, does anyone else know Bonhoeffer was actually a double agent? 
like he worked for the German government, but against the Nazis in planning the plot, I believe. That's just a point of clarification. Yeah, that's, that's right. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. You have a good week, Mary. Thank you. All the best. Okay. Do I have too many questions? Have a good week, everyone. Good week.